It's now more than five years since the British government stepped in to rescue RBS from total ruin and prevent the potential complete collapse of the economy. For the first time, someone has brought together everything that happened at RBS right from the start. From when it was initially founded as a humble Scottish bank in 1727, to its near death in 2008 as a sickly monster bloated by greed. That person is journalist and author Ian Martin and his book, which features testimony from almost all the key players both before and after its rescue, is called Making It Happen, Fred Goodwin, RBS and the men who blew up the British economy. Ian came into IB Times UK's Canary Wharf office to speak with us about his book. Hi Ian, thanks very much for coming in. We talk about Fred Goodwin, he's been a pariah in the press and he's taken so much stick for what happened but how much of the blame do you think for what happened at RBS post 2000 can be laid at his feet because ultimately he was allowed to do all these things by the people around him mm. and the system that he was working in? I think he uh, I think he deserves a lot of blame and he's not spared in my book I'm going to set out to write a book that's as fair and as straightforward as possible um, but even though he deserves a lot, of, a lot of blame, I think it strikes me as a classic British establishment hit job, the way in which it suited a lot of very powerful people who also had questions to answer about their role in the run-up to the crisis. It suited a lot of people to be able to say, ultimately, to understand this crisis, understand it being really just all about him, if it's, it's just about one guy or maybe him and maybe... James Crosby, who ran HBOS, and that allows a lot of other people to get away from the scene. Um, it's a bit like the Titanic disaster. If you can just get in a, in a lifeboat and keep on rowing, eventually you hope that uh, people will forget that you were there. But he has also been, if he wanted to set himself up, Goodwin, I mean, as the, as the villain of the piece, as the, as the poster boy of the entire financial crisis, he couldn't have done a better job if he'd tried because of the way he's handled the aftermath. So he walked into it. But, um, yeah, he, he, deserves, he deserves a lot of blame, but so do a lot of other people. He certainly sounds like a bit of a, a character, should we say. Um, and he had some interesting quirks, as you mentioned in the book, like being obsessed with detail to the point where one year he took control of the RBS Christmas card, which is something I found quite funny, mm. um, and to revelling in the humiliation of his own senior staff. But now you've spoken to loads of people who work with him and who knew him, what's your honest opinion of the man? Do you think that he was as villainous as, as like you say, as the, as the press made out afterwards? I think he was clearly a very talented guy, clearly very bright, uh, not a banker, interestingly, which people often forget. He was an accountant by training and he'd been a very, very good, fast rising, smart um, uh, auditor. And that's how he then got poached and went into banking. So he had talent um, and he was a brilliant project manager, for example, when RBS took over the much bigger English bank, NatWest, in, uh, in, in 2000. It was Goodwin that handled the integration, and even his critics internally in RBS uh, at the time would say he was very, very good at it. Um, but then, when he then becomes CEO, he hasn't been a banker, he's only been a banker for five years, then becomes CEO of one of Britain's fastest growing banks, RBS, in, in, in the early 2000s. A couple of personality flaws and issues end up costing RBS and, and UK economy very dear. Firstly, he's not a banker, so he's not interested in a lot of the basic components of banking, credit, risk, liquidity, capital, all of the things which a, uh, a good banker, if they've joined a bank from school or after university, are taught from the start that that's basics, what the business... The crucial basics. The crucial basics yeah. that, uh, that, that banking rests on and an, and an understanding that banking rests on confidence and trust. Um, so he didn't have an interest in, 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 in those concepts and he instead set his executives very aggressive targets and micromanaged their targets and if they didn't hit their targets for growth, um, uh, he got very, very annoyed with them. So he was a micromanager in that sense and managing a, lo a lot of largely irrelevant details, as you said, things like the, getting the cars spray painted, the, his fleet of Mercedes spray painted the precise shade uh, of RBS Blue, but also he was he, he he didn't invent the strategy at RBS. That was 
arguably was the guy, definitely the guy before him, Sir George Mathewson, who had set out to rescue RBS in the 1980s and 1990s. It was a very old fashioned, small, modest Scottish bank that nearly went bust in the early 1990s. So it was under his leadership, it was modernized aggressively. And at the root of that was an attempt to modernize also the Scottish economy, which had lost a lot of its heavy industry. And Mathewson had a nationalistic or patriotic view that if you reinvented RBS, you could save the Scottish economy and you could build something great, as he used to say to his team in the early 1990s, where is it written that Scotland can't have the world's best or the world's biggest bank? So Goodwin was hired by Mathewson to continue that work uh, and to take all of that uh, to new heights, which he then did. And in the 2000s, that aggressive expansion, which Mathewson had started, Goodwin continued, and which the board totally bought into, and for the most part, the large shareholders bought into, he then faced insufficient challenge um, and a loss of the checks and controls that should have worked, the board, um, et cetera, uh, the various chairmen failed, uh, and his management team didn't challenge him enough, or he created, because of that bullying culture he'd created by micromanagement, he created a culture in which he was insufficiently challenged both above and immediately below him. Mm -hmm. It was catastrophic. And one of the other people that, like we were saying earlier, there's, you know, it's convenient for Goodwin and Crosby to be vilified. Um, one of the other people who perhaps not a lot of mud stuck to over the, over the financial crisis is Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England. Mm. So how do you think it's fair that Goodwin has been vilified that much and Mervyn King's kind of got away with, with relatively unscathed? despite the fact that the financial crisis happened on his watch, and it was while he was governor of the Bank of England that he steered them towards inflation targeting, and that was, that was their raison d'etre, and, and you know, he wasn't really necessarily that interested in the financial stability side of things. I think it's incredible and very British that Mervyn King is there at the scene of the disaster uh, and has so many questions to answer about his uh, conduct um, in, the, in, in the boom years, uh, and fails to spot what's coming until very, very late uh, when he realises there are some difficulties um, in late 06 and 07, by which point the damage is done in terms of the expansion of the banking system. Uh, and uh, having failed in that regard, he ends up, after the crisis, um, being governor of a bank that has its powers hugely en en enhanced uh, and expanded, and ends up with the standard seat in the, in, in the House of Lords. I mean, King, where, King's, where King, I think, is, is most interesting is in, is you mentioned narrow inflation targeting. He's part of that group of policymakers, and Alan Greenspan is obviously the high priest of that, of that movement, and Gordon Brown, his great friend, supporter, cheerleader. And they believe from the late 1990s onwards that policymakers have discovered how to manage, manage potential crises, flooding the market with liquidity, et cetera, so that you could, if a bubble blew up and burst, um, you could mop up afterwards. And that King's belief was that instead, his primary role was to worry about narrow inflation targeting and managing that and interest rates worries about productivity as well. And the financial stability side of the bank became very unfashionable to work, work there. The, the um, that function was, in a sense, run down or um, not given the attention that it should have been. And you had then, also you had a regulator, the FSA, um, here at Canary Wharf, distant from the Bank of England physically and intellectually. Uh, and they were managing the day-to-day -day supervision of the banks. And it just fell through the cracks, really, the idea that, that, that idea that it was almost no one's primary responsibility to say, hold on, what's happening here to the British banking system? Are these risks that are being run, um, you know, are they, are they getting to a point where it's dangerous? And during that period, the figures are listed in, in in my book, um, Bank of England Research, shows you how rapidly banking expanded. Um, and I think that's really the root of, of why the crisis hit Britain so hard and hit Britain harder than other 
countries, uh, and that happened on, on King's Watch.